The Bird of Paradise by R.D. Lang Jesus said to them, When you make the two one, and when you make the inner as the outer, and the outer as the inner, and the above as the below, and when you make the male and female into a single one, so that the male will not be male and the female not be female, when you make eyes in the place of an eye, and a hand in the place of a hand, and a foot in the place of a foot, and an image in the place of an image, then shall you enter the kingdom. Gospel according to Thomas Each night I meet him, king with crown. Each night we fight. Why must he kill me? No, I shall not die. I can be smaller than a pinhead, harder than a diamond. Suddenly, how gentle he is, one of his tricks. Off with his crown, strike. Bash in his skull, face streams of blood. Tears, perhaps, too late. Off with his head, pith the spine. Die now, O king. Spider crab moves slowly across bedroom wall. Not horrible, not evil. Acceptance. Another one appears, and another. Ugh, no, too much, kill. Suddenly, it was always a bird. So frail, so beautiful. Now, twitching in death agony. What have I done? But why play such a game on me? Why appear so ugly? It's your fault, your fault. Noon, traffic jam. At first, I can't make out why. Then I see... A large, magnificent dog is wandering in aimless circles across the road. It wanders closer to my car. I begin to realize that there is something terribly damaged about it. Yes, back broken. And as it veers round, the left face comes into view. Bashed in, bloody, formless mess, on which its eye lies somehow intact, looking at me, with no socket, just by itself alone, detached. A crowd has gathered, laughing, jeering, at the ridiculous behavior of this distracted creature. Motorists hoot their horns and shout at it to get out of the way. Shop girls have come out of their shops and giggle together. Can I be that dog? And those angry motorists? And those giggling shop girls? Is Christ forgiving me for crucifying him? Glasgow, Gray Street. Blank, faceless tenements streaming with my drizzle. Red only in children's cheeks. Light fading from still laughing eyes. Glasgow repartee. Fella to passing lady, bird. Hey, hen. I'll heat your water. Bird. You're not going to dip your wick in it anyway. Those termini of Glasgow tram cars in the 1930s in November Sunday afternoon. The end. Flaking plaster. Broken window panes. The smell of slum tenements. The dank closes on a Sunday morning. Impregnated with stale beer, vomit, fish and chips. All that floral wallpaper and those borders... Those curtains and those blinds, the three-piece uncut moquette, the tiled fireplaces, the fire guards, the acres and acres of mock parquet linoleum, the tiled clothes with banister and the stained glass window, the respectability, oh, the respectability. Mrs. Campbell was a nice young mother of two children. She had rather suddenly started to lose weight and her abdomen had begun to swell. But she did not feel too ill in herself. The medical student has to take a history of the illness. I made the mistake of chatting with her, learning about her little boy and her little girl, what she was knitting, and so on. She came into our surgical ward on a Sunday. A mark was placed on her abdomen to show where the lower border of her liver was, because it was enlarged. On Monday, her liver had grown further down. Even cancer can't grow at that rate. 
she was evidently suffering from something very unusual. Her liver continued to grow every day. By Thursday, it was clear she was going to die. She did not know this, and no one dreamt of telling her. We've decided you don't need an operation. When will I be going home then? Well, perhaps in a little while, but we still have to keep you under observation. But will I be getting any treatment? Don't worry, Mrs. Campbell, leave it to us. We still have some investigations to do yet. She probably had a hemorrhage going on inside her liver. But why? Secondary growths from a cancer somewhere? But where? Every part of her body had been probed, palpated, up her rectum, vagina, down her throat, x-rayed, urine, feces, blood. It was an interesting clinical problem. On Friday morning, the students met with one of the young surgeons and her case was discussed. No one had seen such a case. We would find out at the post-mortem, of course. But it would be nice if we could hit the diagnosis beforehand. Someone suggested a small tumor in her retina. Her eyes had been looked into, but these tumors are sometimes very small indeed, easy to miss. When she had been first examined, this wasn't being looked for specifically. Perhaps it was a long shot. It was almost lunchtime. At lunchtime, over 500 students ran from their classes all over the university buildings to the students' refectory, where there was seating for 200. If you didn't get at the top of the queue, you would have to wait an hour or more, and you only had an hour before the next lecture. But we just had time to dash up to look into her eyes. When we got to her, the nurses were already laying her out, tying up her ankles. Fuck it, she's dead. Still, quickly, before the cornea clouds over. We looked into the depths of her dead eyes. Dead only a few minutes after all. If you look into eyes at that time, it's interesting anyway. You see the blood actually beginning to break up in the veins of the retina. But apart from that, we have nothing to see. Fucker, we've missed our fucking lunch. Bookshop, Glasgow. Usual copy of Horizon. The last number. It is closing time now in the gardens of the West. From now on, a writer will be judged by the resonances of his silence and the quality of his despair. All right, you did not have a circulation of more than 80,000. You ran out of money. But you bastards, speak for yourself. Write Horizon off and wish yourself off. Don't write me off. I'll be judged by my music, not by my silence, and by the quality of whatever pathetic shreds of faith, hope, and charity still cling to me. American Sailor to Glasgow Harry. Baby, I'm going to give you something you've never had before. Glasgow Harry to friend. Hey, Maggie, there's a guy here with leprosy. Fifty cadavers laid out on slabs. Before we are finished, we shall each have gotten to know one of them intimately. At the end of that term, when they all had been dissected to bits, suddenly, so it seemed, no one knew how it began. Pieces of skin, muscle, penises, bits of liver, lung, heart, tongue, etc., etc., were all flying about, shouts, screams. Who was fighting whom? God knows. The professor had been standing in the doorway for some while before his presence began to creep through the room. Silence. You should be ashamed of yourselves, he thundered. How do you expect them to sort themselves out on the day of judgment? He was ten years of age and had hydrocephalus due to an inoperable tumor the size of a very small pea, just at the right place to stop his cerebrospinal fluid from getting out of his head which is to say that he had water on the brain, that he was bursting his head, so that the brain was becoming stretched out into a thinning rim, and his skull bones likewise. He was in excruciating and unremitting pain. One of my jobs was to put a long needle into this ever-increasing fluid to let it out. I had to do this twice a day, and the so clear fluid that was killing him would leap out at me from his massive ten-year-old head rising in a brief column to several feet, sometimes hitting my face. Cases like this are usually less distressing than they might be, because they are often heavily doped. They partially lose their faculties. Sometimes an operation helps. He had had several, but the new canal that was made didn't work. 
The condition can sometimes be stabilized at the level of being a chronic vegetable for indefinite years, so that the person finally does not seem to suffer. Do not despair. The soul dies even before the body. But this little boy unmistakably endured agony. He would quietly cry in pain. If he would only have shrieked or complained, and he knew he was going to die. He had started reading the Pickwick Papers. The one thing he asked God for, he told me, was that he be allowed to finish this book before he died. He died before it was half finished. I know so many bad jokes. At least I didn't invent them. Jimmy McKenzie was a bloody pest at the mental hospital because he went around shouting back at his voices. We could only hear one end of the conversation, of course, but the other end could be inferred in general terms, at least from, a way to fuck, you filthy-minded bastards. It was decided at one and the same time to alleviate his distress and ours by giving him the benefit of a lobotomy. An improvement in his condition was noted. After the operation, he went around no longer shouting abuse at his voices, but instead, What's that? Say that again? Speak up, you buggers. I cannot hear you. We had been attending a childbirth and it had dragged on and off for 16 hours. Finally, it started to come, gray, slimy, cold. Out it came, a large human frog, an anencephalic monster, no neck, no head, with eyes, nose, froggy mouth, long arms. The creature was born at 9, 10 a.m. on a clear August morning. Maybe it was slightly alive. We didn't want to know. We wrapped it in the newspaper, and with this bundle under my arm to take back to the pathology lab that seemed to cry out for all the answerable answers that I ever asked, I walked along O'Connell Street two hours later. I needed a drink. I went into a pub, put the bundle on the bar. Suddenly, the desire to unwrap it, to hold it up for all to see, a ghastly gorgon's head to turn the world to stone. I could show you the exact spot on the pavement to this day. Fingertips, legs, lungs, genitals, all thinking. These people in the street are there, I see them. We are told they are something out there that traverses space, hits eyes, goes to brain. Then an event occurs whereby this event in my brain is experienced by me as those people out there in space. The I that I am is not the me that I know, but the wherewith and whereby the me is known. But if this I that is the wherewith and whereby is not anything that I know, then it is no thing, nothing. Click. Sluice gates open. Body guts outside in. Head with legs sings merrily in the streets, led along by a beggar. The head is an egg. A stupid old woman pries open the egg head fetus. Its singing is its cries of unspeakable agony. The old woman sets fire to the fetus. It turns inside the egghead as though in a frying pan. Commotion. Its agony and helplessness is indescribable. I am burning. I can't move. There are cries. It's dead. But the doctor pronounces that it's still alive and orders it to be taken to a hospital. Two men sit facing each other and both of them are me. Quietly, meticulously, systematically, they are blowing out each other's brains with pistols. They look perfectly intact, inside devastation. I look round a new town. What a pity about those viscera and abortions littering the new spick and span gutters. This one looks like a heart. It is pulsating. It starts to move on four little legs. It is disgusting and grotesque. Dog-like abortion of raw red flesh and yet alive. Stupid, flayed, abortive dog, still persisting and living. Yet all it asks after all is that I let it love me, and not even that. Astonished heart, loving, unloved heart, heart of a heartless world, crazy heart of a dying world. Playing the game of reality with no real cards in one's hand. Body mangled, torn to shreds, ground down to powder, limbs aching, heart lost, 
bones pulverized, empty nausea in dust, wanting to vomit up my lungs. Everywhere, blood, tissues, muscles, bones are wild, frantic. Outwardly, all is quiet, calm as ever. Sleep, death, I look all right. That wild, silent screech in the night. And what if I were to tear my hair and run naked and screaming through the suburban night? I would wake up a few tired people and get myself committed to a mental hospital. To what purpose? 5 a.m. Vultures hover outside my window. Majestic forest, hot summer's day. Proud trees, well-rooted in earth, scraping heaven. Tall, powerful, a forest at its grandest. The woodcutters come. They saw and hack down the trees. Who can endure or escape the agony of those saws? The trees are felled, processed in sawmills, sawn down and down and down, finally to sawdust, finer and finer grained, less and less and less, dissolving into the stuff of all the world. The lotus opens, movement from earth through water, from fire to air, out and in, beyond life and death now, beyond inner and outer, sense and nonsense, meaning and futility, male and female, being and non-being, light and darkness, void and plenum, beyond all duality or non-duality, beyond and beyond, disincarnation, I breathe again. The farther in, large or small, the more and less there is, more and more nothing, further into the atom, further out into space, nothing. The portal of the last judgment of autumn and the center of an atom are identical, jumping Jesus, ecstasy, cosmic froth and bubbles of perpetual movement of creation, redemption, resurrection, judgment, last and first, and ultimate beginning and end are one mandala of Adam flower of Christ. The eye of the needle is here and now, Two heartbeats in lace infinity. What we know is froth and bubbles. Light, light of the world, that irradiates me and shines through my eyes. Inner sun that emblazons me, brighter than ten thousand suns. Terror of being blinded, frizzled up, destroyed. Clutch at myself, fall. Fall away from light to darkness, from the kingdom into exile, from eternity to time from heaven to earth, away, away, away and out, down and out, through and past winds of other worlds, spiral energy dance, through and past galaxies of stars, colors, gems, through and past the beginnings of contentions. The fingers of the one hand begin to fight one another. Beginnings of gods, each level of being longing now for the lower, Gods fighting and fucking themselves into incarnation. Demigods, heroes, mortal men, carnage, butchery of spirit in final horror of incarnation. Blood, agony, exhaustion of spirit, struggle between death and rebirth, innervation and regeneration. Cosmic vomit, sperm, smegma, diarrhea, sweat, at all events, an insignificant particle on the way out. The vision has ended. I am starting to dream again. Concussed. Fragmented scraps of memory. Poor, raw, smashed egghead. A time hemorrhage in the body of eternity. Beginning to think again. To grasp, to connect, to put together, to remember. Only to remember to remember. Or at least remember you have forgotten each forgetting a dismembering. I must never forget again. All that searching and researching those false signposts, the terrible danger of forgetting that one has forgotten. It's too awful. Behind, above, beyond, and in man, the war rages on. Man, me and you, is not the only side of the battle, but he is one region of it, Mind and body are torn, ripped, shredded, ravaged, exhausted by these powers and principalities in their cosmic conflict 
that we cannot even identify. We are shattered, tattered, demented remnants of a once glorious army. Among us are princes and captains of armies, lords of battle, amnesiac, aphasic, ataxic, jerkily trying to recall what was the battle, the sounds of which still ring in our ears. Is the battle still raging? If we could only make contact with headquarters, only make our way back to join the main body of the army. A soldier on the wall at the furthest reaches of the empire, looking out towards the darkness and danger. The next nearest comrade is out of sight. I must not desert. I will be recalled to the capital in good time. Gropings, orientations, crumbs, fragments, bits of the jigsaw, a few demented ravings that may help the reconstruction of the lost message. I am just beginning to regain my memory, just beginning to realize I am lost, just getting faint sounds of old familiar music, snatches of old tunes, moments of deja vu, a reawakening of a long, numbed agony, an unendurable realization of what a debacle it was, what a shambles, what betrayal, horror, stupidity, ignorance, cowardice, craven lust, wretched greed, faint recall of a raving nostalgia for the kingdom, the power and the glory, paradise lost. We tramps have so lost our wits, we do not know what to steal or even how to beg. We are the bereft, derelicts, fishes, washed up and out in their death throes, twitching, rubbing themselves together for their own slime. Don't be a shy fish. This is no time for dignity or heroics. Our best hope is in cowardice and treachery. I would rather even be white than dead. Mid-ocean, shipwreck. Survivors are being picked up. The crew are saved, but not the captain, governor, the boss. The rescue ship moves away from the scene. Empty, still, desolate ocean. Slow track over a surface. Suddenly, like a bird, I swoop down. There is the captain. Is he dead? A sodden doll just afloat and no more. If he is not already dead, it seems he will certainly drown soon. Suddenly, he is washed up at a fishing village. The fishermen don't know whether he is alive or dead, a captain or a doll or a queer fish. A doctor comes along, guts him open like a fish, or rips him open like a doll. There is a sodden, gray little man inside. Artificial respiration. He moves. He reddens with blood. Maybe he will make it. How careful I must be. What a near thing. If only this really is the king coming back again. The captain come to take over command. Now I can start up again, putting things in order, repairs, reconstructions, projects, plans, campaigns. Oh, yes. There is another region of the soul called America. It is impossible to express America. That last night was quite something, a highly intelligent gathering, so very white, so very Jewish, I began to realize I was sat beside a bust in something like terracotta of perhaps a Buddha. It was calm and still saying nothing, doing nothing. I further began to realize that there was a light coming from the top of its head, a 60-watt electric light bulb. Indeed, I kid you not, it was a lampstand. What the fuck are you doing with a Buddha as a lampstand? Oh, that's not a Buddha. That's some high goddess or other. There presides over America a female effete laughing Buddha, fat beyond reason or imagination, creased with myriad folds and convolutions. The fat is on the turn. This she Buddha is compounded of some cosmic muck, and that is now fibrillating with monstrous pruritic desire. Millions of men fall on her to fuck away her unspeakable and insatiable obscene itch. They all get lost in the endless, greasy, fatty morass of her rancid recesses. This writing is not exempt. It remains like all writing, an absurd and revolting effort to make an impression on a world that will remain as unmoved as it is avid. If I could turn you on, if I could drive you out of your wretched mind, if I could tell you, I would let you know. Who is not engaged in trying to impress to leave a mark, 
to engrave his image on the others and the world, graven images held more dear than life itself. We wish to die leaving our imprints burned into the hearts of the others. What would life be if there were no one to remember us, to think of us when we are absent, to keep us alive when we're dead? And when we are dead, suddenly or gradually, our presence, scattered in ten or ten thousand hearts, will fade and disappear. How many candles and how many hearts? Of such stuff is our hope and our despair. How do you plug a void, plugging a void? How to inject nothing into fuck all? How to come into a gone world? No piss, shit, smegma, cum, mucoid, viscoid, soft or hard, or even tears of eyes, ears, arse, cunt, prick, nostrils, done to any T, of man or alligator, tortoise or daughter, will plug up the hole. It's gone past all that. That, all that, last desperate clutch. Come into gone, I do assure you. The dreadful has already happened. Debris, the old style, all those endearing. I want you to taste and smell me, want to be palpable, to get under your skin, to be an itch in your brain and in your guts that you can't scratch out and that you can't allay, that will corrupt and destroy you and drive you mad. Who can write entirely with unadulterated compassion? All prose, all poetry, to the extent that it is not compassion, is failure. Watch it. Care. Calm. Caution. Don't try it on too much. Don't exploit it. Just keep your place. Just don't ask for trouble. Remember, your hands have blood on them. Just don't be too cheeky or too greedy. Don't puff yourself up too much. Remember your place in the hierarchy. Don't try to come it. Don't shout about it. Don't posture. Don't give yourself airs. Don't think you're going to get away from it. You've had a bit of the piss taken out of you. Don't make excuses. Don't kick it around. Who are you trying to kid? A little humility. A fraction of love. A grain of trust. You've been told as much as you need to know. You've had quite your fair share. Don't try the patience of the gods. Shut up and get on with it. Remember, there's not much time left. The flood and the fire are upon us. Yes, there are moments. Sometimes there is magic. Wince with a smile. Nothing so becomes a man. That forlorn faiblesse, that gentle nostalgia, ik nicht, tenderness too is possible. Ah, tenderness. Wandering. Suddenly I come upon one of my many childhoods, preserved in forgetfulness, for this moment when it was most required. He and she. A sad little tune. Its fingers so tentatively reach out towards our untouchable happiness. Its very gentle smile so tactfully offers consolation we do not ask for. She, my heart is full of ashes and lemon peel. He, do not go too far away. She, I shall only go into myself. You will always find me there. He, if I love the whole world as I love you, I would die. Forests and cataracts of intricate interstitial landscapes cascades and waterfalls, through and past elbows to promontories of fingers, star of nerves, arteries of champagne. Her image tingles my fingertips, uncoils my recoiling flesh, touches a lost nerve of courage, entices an uncertain gesture of delight to adventure into being. The dance begins, worms underneath fingertips, lips beginning to pulse, heartache and throat catch, all slightly out of step and out of key, each its own tempo and rhythm, slowly connections, lip to lip, heart to heart, finding self in other, dreadfully, tentatively, burningly, notes finding themselves in chords, chords in sequence, 
cacophony turning into polyphonous contrapuntal chorus, a diapason of celebration. Dancing waves of fluent highs and lows of lips and nipples, fingers, spines, thighs, laughing, intertwining, intermingling, fusing, and somewhere touched, an ultimate joy and gladness, lovely, lightful life, diffusing an ever newer, fiercer freshness. Yes, this is possible, where from or where to, no more need to ask, him and her, you and me, become us, more than a moment of us, and a not too despairing declension. What more, what more is there to ask? Tidal wave, one million miles high, moving at speed of light, impossible to go above or beneath, to run away, to get round to left or right. The government fires the land with massive flamethrowers, earth to desert, to absorb the water. Fire against water. Don't panic. Tessellated marble at gate of sixth heaven may be mistaken for water. Garden, cat at bird. Shoo off, nasty cat, and catch bird. How elusive she is, and I am turning into a cat myself. Stop. Cat is a cat, is a bird, is a non-bird, of ineffably frail space, suddenly spreading in parabolic grace of authority. How foolish to worry, to try to save her or grasp her. Perhaps the cat was trying to save her. Let be, cat and bird, be griff. The truth I am trying to grasp is the grasp that is trying to grasp it. I have seen the bird of paradise. She has spread herself before me, and I shall never be the same again. There is nothing to be afraid of. Nothing. Exactly. The life I am trying to grasp is the me that is trying to grasp it. There is really nothing more to say when we come back to that beginning of all beginnings that is nothing at all. Only when you begin to lose that alpha and omega do you want to start to talk and to write, and then there is no end to it. Words, words, words. At best and most, they are perhaps in memoriam, evocations, conjurations, incantations, emanations, shimmering iridescent flares in the sky of darkness, a just still feasible tact, indiscretions, perhaps forgivable. City lights at night from the air, receding like these words, atoms, each containing its own world and every other world, each a fuse to set you off. If I could turn you on, if I could drive you out of your wretched mind, if I could tell you, I would let you know.